thanks for the introduction and the invitation. And today I will talk about the sparsity of rational and algebraic points. Um, I'll start with an ancient question. Um, we know that in mathematics, it's a fundamental question to solve equations like PDE or ODE. But in this talk, I will focus on one type of uh, equa equations and finding certain type of solution. Uh, this is this example that I wrote. So we take a polynomial in two variables with coefficients in Q. Uh, the question is, what can we say about the Q solutions to fxy equals zero? And this kind of question is very ancient question. It dates back to the ancient Greek time and it's called different time problems. And here's the book uh, where these questions were first formulated. And here are some examples. Uh, uh, one, the first example is uh, a, uh, x squared plus y squared minus one. And for this example, uh, we have infinitely many Q solutions uh, corresponding to the Pythagorean triples, like three over five, four over five, five over 13, 12 over 13, etc. In the second example, we have a, a, cubic, a cubic equation, y squared minus x cubed minus three. And we only uh, have finally many Q solutions, three of them. The third example is similar to the second example in the sense that the equation is still cubic, but in this example, we have infinitely many solutions. The fourth example is uh, a polynomial of higher degree. And again, we have only finitely many solutions. So what's the difference between them? Well, we, here we see that the degree of the polynomials are very are different. The first one is quadratic and we have infinitely many. Both the second one and third one are cubic, but one of them has finitely many, one of them has infinitely many Q solutions. And the last one has a degree higher than three. Um, the way to understand one, or at least one way to understand this phenomenon is to write down, to, to consider all the complex solutions. Uh, and then uh, try to draw the uh, try to draw the Riemann surface or the algebraic curve associated with this uh, equations. Uh, we consider all the complex uh, complex solutions and uh, draw them down in c square, and then compactify them and uh, uh, and then do the desingularization. Uh, what we get is the so-called uh, algebraic curve. And in the first, uh, and the difference between these algebraic curves is that they have different number of genuses, a gene, or the number of holes are different. In the first example, it's just a sphere. In the second example, we have one hole. Uh, third example is also one hole. And the fourth example, we have two holes. These holes, if you know them, they are called the genus of the curve. In the first example, it's a genus zero curve. And both the second and third example uh, are genus one curves. Uh, and the fourth example is a genus two curve. Okay, and now from now on, uh, I will talk about these equations according to their genus. And in the whole talk, I will fix a number G uh, and the number D, which are uh, integers. G is negative, D is positive. And I will fix the number field of degree D, uh, which I call it K. And C will denote a, a irreducible smooth projective curve of genus G defined over this number field. That means if we write down the system of polynomial equations defining C, we can choose one uh, system of polynomials with coefficients in K. And usually we denote by CK, uh, the set of K points on C or uh, the set of K solutions to this system of polynomials. And the first case when G is zero, this is relatively simple. Uh, we have two cases, either CK, uh, either C doesn't have any rational point, K point, or C uh, has at least one rational point, uh, at least one K point, in which case C is isomorphic to P1 over this K. And then we have like local global principles. And the next, uh, next case is when G equals one. This is a, this is a very interesting case. Um, in this case, either again, C doesn't have any K point or C had at least, uh, C had at least one K point, in which case 
CK, this set of rational points, it has a structure of abelian groups with an identity element. And we call this pair C with this distinguished point, an elliptic curve defined over K. So both the curve and the point are defined over K. Um, a famous theorem of model way asserts that EK is a finally generated abelian group. So first of all, C, uh, EK, it has a structure of abelian group. So that means it has its torsion free part, which is Z to the power of rho with sub rho, which a priori might be infinite. And it has the torsion part, which also a priori might be infinite. But the theory of model way says that no, rho must be finite and the torsion part is also finite. So it's finally generated. And then to understand this EK, we have two parts to understand. The torsion, uh, the torsion free part is rho and torsion part. For the, uh, for the rho, um, in general, there is no effective method to calculate it, although in some particular cases one can. Um, but the biggest conjecture in this area is the Birch and Schwinton die conjecture. It asserts that rho um, equals um, the, uh, the order of some L function associated with E using some, again, local global principles. And here is a list of uh, people who contributed to this conjecture according to Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on that. And if you don't agree with this list, just feel free to edit the Wikipedia page. Um, in practice, Sometimes we are okay to just find an upper bound on this row in particular cases. And there's a very explicit upper bound by O and top in, 90, uh, in, uh, in 89. So here it depends on the conductor of E and the, uh, with two constants depending on K in an, uh, in an explicit way, meaning that they depend on the degree and the discriminant of the field. Um, um, a bigger question is, um, is rho bounded for a fixed k? Let's just look at the case when k equals q. Is rho bounded for all of, uh, is rho bounded for all the curves defined over q? Well, there are the divergent opinions on this. For example, uh, recently there's this heuristic of Park, Kuhnen, White, and Wood which suggests that there might be only finally many elliptic curves defined over q with that we rank with this row larger than 21. On the other hand, we do already have examples of elliptic curve defined over Q with this row bigger than 21. For example, Alkis in 2006 showed uh, uh, constructing an elliptic curve, a very explicit one with model we rank this row at least 28. And it is proved to be 28 under GRH. Okay, so this is the torsion free part. And for the torsion part, uh, Barry Mazur proved the following result. So um, the, the cardinality of this torsion part is uniformly bounded for all E. And this result was generalized uh, to uh, arbitrary number field by Camiani, Mazur, and finally by Morel uh, for arbitrary number field. And actually when proving this result, which is about curves of genus one, Mazur and Morel and Kamiani and Morel, what they actually proved is a result for curves of higher genus. So this is this is what what is proved in the, in that paper in in the paper of Mazur. He showed that if n is large enough, then the only q points of some other curves, which are called modular curves, are the only q points are the rational cusps. So in other words, for these kind of particular curves, um, the set of Q points can be determined very explicitly when N is large enough. And these curves are often of genus at least two. So to study curves of genus one, uh, we also need results on genus at least two. So uh, in the rest of the talk, I will pass to curves of genus at least two. So this is the general, uh, uh, a statement for this current case is the model conjecture made about a hundred years ago, and it was proved by Faltins in 83. He showed that if G is at least two, then C has only finally many K points. 
So before moving on, let's uh, digest what this theorem says. First of all, this theorem is a very, very strong theorem because the hypothesis is short, it's topological, it's just this weak topological hypothesis on the, uh, the genus is at least two, that's all. But the conclusion is a very strong arithmetic one. It says that the system of equa polynomial equations has only finitely many rational solutions. So this is a very strong conclusion. Uh, if we look at Mazur's result, which was uh, 77 before Faulkner's theorem, it says that before, it says that for this particular kind of curve, whose genus is easy to calculate in general, if n is at least 16, then it has only finally many Q points, finally many rational points. Um, so this is really a strong result. It, it, it in particular applies to Mazur's result. But on the other hand, this proof is not constructive, meaning that given the particular, given the particular curve, even if it's over Q, we cannot determine the set of rational points of this curve by the proof or by any known proof of the theorem. So for example, in, Ma in Mazur's result, Mazur really determined this set. Well, Fortin's theorem doesn't, at least the proofs uh, uh, up, up to today, they don't. So this is the first digest of the theorem. Another phenomenon, which is maybe more uh, famous about this um, theorem, Fortin's theorem versus a particular concrete example is Fermat's last theorem. Uh, here, let's fix n to be an integer. I will write down at least four uh, and fn to be the curve defined by this equation. Uh, one can show that the genus uh, is at least two. Then applying Fulton's theorem, one gets only finally many rational solutions to this equation. And this is Fermat's last theorem. Uh, well, the equation showing up in Fermat's last theorem. Um, so just Fulton's, Fulton's already proved that this equation has only finally many rational solutions. But for this example, more expe is expected. We want to know that the only Q solutions to this, uh, to this polynomial is the are the trivial ones, meaning that one of X and Y must be zero. And this is indeed proved by Wells and Taylor Wells in 95, known as the Fermat's last theorem. Okay, so again, in this example, just by following this theorem, we get the finiteness, but we need some other uh, tools or actually the, the proof of an up from our last theorem doesn't, uh, it doesn't really depend on faulting the theorem at all. So um, yeah, it, it shows that we, it determines the, the exact set uh, of Q solutions to this particular polynomial. Okay, um, but this example is also show, also suggests that it's extremely hard to compute the set of rational points on, uh, on, the, uh, on the given curve, even just for Q. Instead, here is a more achievable but still fundamental question. Is there an easy upper bound for the, uh, for the uh, cardinality of the set of rational points? And how do these K points distribute on C? So this is a question one which we can ask and probably it's easier to answer. And uh, for this question, it, it dates back really to, to at least to model. Um, we have different ways to understand and to analyze this question. We have finiteness, upper bound, uniformity of uh, bounds on, on this cardinality and effective model. So in the rest of my talk, I will explain this, uh, this question and what is known on this question according to this grace. The first one finiteness was proved by faultings. And here is the proof. This is extracted from Seminaire sur les bains arithmétiques, uh, asterisk 127 by Lucien Spiro. Um, this picture is part of the picture. Uh, what I want to talk say about this picture is that this is the proof of faultings. Uh, uh, this is a proof by faulting of Mondel, Mondel conjecture. And actually what this proof really showed is a result on integral points on modular spaces. It really established the uh, Shafarevich conjecture. And then using the Kodava partial construction, this result on integral points of modular space implies 
a result on rational points on curves. So what Fontaine's really proved is a result on integral points on modular space. And now uh, recently there is a new proof to this fact by Lawrence and Van Katesh, okay, by modifying some parts in, in, the, in this picture. Okay, so this is the first proof of Falkins uh, of the model conjecture. Today I will focus on a second, the second proof of model conjecture, which is different. Uh, it is by Voita. This is really a different proof, and it, it, it's by Dufantine method and some article of geometry. And in this proof, we also see some descriptions of the distribution points on C. Uh, and this leads to explicit upper bound on the cardinality of CK. Fortin's first proof gives an upper bound, but an ad hoc one. This gives an explicit one, and the proof was simplified by Bombieri, uh, generalized by Fortin's to some high dimensional cases. So the starting point of Voita's proof, also of Fortin's first proof, is that assume this CK is non empty. So in this case, we take one particular rational point, and then we see C as a curve in this Jacobian via the uh, Abel Jacobian embedding based at this point. And then if we base that a rational point, then the set of rational points is, in, in, is a subset of the set of rational points of this Jacobian. And JK is an Abelian variety. It has more structures. It is an Abelian group. Um, and the more structures we have in general, the more tools we have, the easier we are able to attack this, uh, the problems. So we have this embedding first. And then on JK, we have more tools. And here is one particular tool that we're gonna use. So on the Jacobian, we have a normalized height function. It is a function from the set of algebraic points uh, on J, on the Jacobian, to the set of non-negative uh, real numbers. And it vanishes precisely on the torsion points. Uh, we restrict this height function to the set of rational points and then tensor it with R. The good, uh, one good property of this height function is that it, 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 it extends linearly, real linearly to a function like this, and we get a quadratic, and this, this function after the extension is still quadratic and positive definite. Also pay attention in this process, also the torsion points are killed. So the, to the, the, the only points killed by this function are precisely the torsion points. And now we have on the left-hand side, we have a real vector space, uh, which is finite dimensional by model way theorem. And we have a quadratic positive definite function on it. If we take the square root, then it becomes a normed Euclidean space. So here we have a Euclidean space on the left-hand side. And JK, it is a lattice inside this, uh, uh, inside this Euclidean space. So here it is the dotted points. Some dotted points are points on CK, which are in this picture, the red points and the blue points. Um, uh, there are the points in CK. And if we have on a finite dimensional real vector space, if we have a norm, then we can define an inner product and the angle between each two points. For example, if we have one point here and one point here, we can define the angle of these two points. Okay, there, there's a definition of angle of these two points. Okay, now <clears throat> let's see. Um, a starting point is the following observation, which by, by, uh, by Manfold, which was in the 60s, actually. It is called Manfold's formula. Uh, what I'm gonna show here is the consequence of this formula. For two distinct points on C, really, really on C, not, not on J, we have the following inequality. So here we have a quadratic form. So P square plus Q square minus two G P Q, the inner product, this is a quadratic form. Okay, this is a leading term. Which is a quadratic form. And then we have a linear term here, which is not a leading term. 
the sum of them is always non-negative if p and q are non-zero. So from this formula or inequality, we also see the difference between the case g equals zero, one, and the case when g is at least two. That is when g is at least two, then this quadratic form is indefinite. And we know that an indefinite quadratic form, a uh, real quadratic form, a priori, it could take any real value. It could be as negative as possible. But here, this, this inequality tells us that no, if we consider, if we study all the rational, uh, the algebraic points on C, uh, in particular, the rational points on C for different points, then this leading term cannot be too negative if the norms are large enough. So that already gives a strong constraint on the pair PQ if they are distinct. So that is what, that only happens when G is at least two. Well, of course, when G equals one, then this leading term is already positive definite. So yeah, so this, this formula doesn't give uh, much more information um, as it does for G at least two. So this already shows that the already it thinks that algebraic points on curves of genius at least two, they are very sparse in some way. So this is already Manfo's observation in the 60s, a Manfo's formula. And the proof of this formula is somehow really geometric. Um, and here is what for, uh, here is um, uh, the, another phenomenon to prove model conjecture, and this phenomenon was proved by Voita. And I will, I, I uh, here in this theorem, I merge Manfo's result and Voita's result in the same theorem. Um, just, just, just this is a statement of theorem, but let's really understand the statement by this picture, by this beautiful sunshine here. Um, the theorem says, so, so Manfo and Voita says the following thing. Inside this Euclidean space, we can we are able to find a capital R, so that if that we draw this ball of radius r center and zero, we draw this ball of radius r as of center at zero in this Euclidean space. And now let's only consider points outside this ball, outside this ball. And there exists a number. Uh, three over four says that if we divide this Euclidean space into cones according to this angle condition, because this thing it really says something about the angle, the inner product over the product of the norms. So this is like the angle of P and Q. Um, if we have two points uh, whose angle is small, that is that means it's smaller than this number here. Um, then these two points, they cannot be too close to each other. What? Sorry? What? It's okay. okay. Someone just unmuted by accident. Ah, okay. So I, I will... Um, okay, I continue. So... Here, um, yeah, in this Euclidean space, we draw this ball of capital, uh, re, uh, capital R, radius capital R. We only consider points outside this ball. And then we divide this um, Euclidean space into cones according to this angle condition. And let's consider points lying in the same cone outside this ball. Um, Manfold claims that each two distinct points here in this cone outside this ball, they cannot be too close to each other. That is here, if we, if we, if we fix a point P here, then the other point Q, it must lie somewhere outside this, uh, the, 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 this area. And Voita, on the other hand, proved that, well, they cannot be too far from each other either. So Q must lie some, somewhere here in, in this stripe here. Um, and this is a very strong condition. Um, what can we do now? Now let's consider all the points lying in the same cone as P. We first of all uh, number them. Um, 
well, a priori, we don't know that there are only finite many of them, but let's just take n of them. So P1 to Pn are distinct points in the same cone, in this cone, um, and we uh, order them in non, uh, in, in non decreasing norms. Then Manfo's inequality, Manfo's result says that, okay, then the norm of Pn must be at least twice the norm of Pn minus one, and then two to the two, two square, the norm of P, um, two square, the norm of Pn minus two, etc. So in the end, it's the norm is at least a two to the power of n times the norm of P. Here, this is this part is manifold. On the other hand, Voita claims that if we just look at P and Pn, then this holds true. The norm of Pn cannot be greater than kappa times the norm of P. And, and then in this inequality, the norm of P cancels out and we get a bound on uh, n. That means in this cone, we can't have more than log two kappa plus one large uh, points in this cone. And also we know how many cones there are because there's this, there, there is this angle condition. We can show that there are at, least, at most seven to the power of the dimension of space, such cones according to the angle condition. And then we do have the finiteness, uh, not only the finiteness, but also we have a, uh, a, an explicit upper bound of the, a large point of the lattice points outside this ball, which are called large points. They are, uh, the number is bounded by this. It's very explicit. Kappa can be made explicit uh, and so on. And now let's uh, further summarize this. So in the previous slides, we saw that uh, Voita proved that there is a, there's a capital R so that we can, we can divide the points into small points, which are the points inside this ball and large points, which are points outside this ball. And then most Manfold and Voigt have proved the results about large points, which gives uh, finiteness, but also it gives something more. It gives a, 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 an upper bound or cardinality of large points. And this R actually, it can be chosen in a, in a, in a further explicit way. That is attached to each curve. There's a canonically defined number, which is called the faulting's height. Uh, it showed up in the first proof of model conjecture by faultings. It this this height measures the, com com the complexity of the coefficients of the equations defining the curve C. Uh, in my talk, I will abuse the notation. I will use this number to denote um, the maximum of one and this faulting's height. So I normalize this height so that it's almost at least one. And um, Bombieri, the Diego, uh, actually Bombieri and the Diego, they show that, um, I think it's really Bombieri, uh, this capital R can be chosen to be linear in terms of the square root of the faulting's height. Okay. Um, and in the previous slides, we show that the number of large points here it is bounded above by a number which depend only on kappa, uh, only on G times seven to the power of the model way rank. But here, but actually Levin Alpogay in 2018, he improved the seven to a number smaller than two. Um, so anyways, we do have a nice upper bound on the cardinality of large points. It is very nice. Uh, it, here you see only the genus here, and here you see the model way rank here. We do have a light, nice upper bound, but then that's it. Of course, uh, but then that's it. Uh, for the small points, temporarily for the finiteness, we don't need to do anything because small points are lattice points inside a ball. And then automatically, there are only finite many of them. So prove to, to prove the finiteness of rational points, we don't need to do anything about the small <coughs> points just results on large points is enough. But of course we do want to have some kind of bound and a, an, explicit, an explicit bound was indeed attained 
by David Philemon and Hemon. So they prove that the cardinality of this rational point, the set of rational points on C is bounded above in terms of four numbers. We have the genus, we have the model we rank as is shown in the large points. We have also another number which is very um, uh, natural. That is a degree of the number field. I mean, anyways, the model we rank, it depends on the degree of number field. And then this faulting height, which is the which is some number uh, measuring the complexity of the the equation defining the curve to coefficients. So this there is an upper bound. So up to now for the classical result, uh, here we have the finiteness on the degrees. Uh, we do have the finiteness. We do have an upper bound. And on this side, regarding the sparsity of the algebraic points. First, we do have one false result, which hints, which suggests that the algebraic points are sparse on these kind of curves. And uh, we also have one false and void has inequality, which are results on the sparsity of large points. They have, uh, yeah, they have consequence on large points. Then we have, then the next step is to ask, do we have some kind of uniformity on the, on the bounds of the cardinality? And do we have effective model? So here uh, on this side, to describe the sparsity of algebraic points and uh, rational points, here we can ask, are there other descriptions which can say at least something about the small points? Uh, so that we have, so that here we have some, uh, some better, some other phenomenon, and here we have some better bounds, better, un more uniform bounds. Uh, do we have something like that? And um, before trying to prove any kind of uniform bounds on this cardinality, let's see how uniform such a bound could be. First of all, this cardinality, it must be depend on the genus. And here's an example of hyperelliptic curves uh, defined by this equation. Um, it has this genus uh, one, 1012, and it has at least uh, 2025 different rational points, if we consider uh, also the points in uh, the infinity, or actually to 2026. Um, um, the thing is, when you write further terms, the genus got higher, higher and the number of different rational points, at least uh, the, the simple ones, we have more and more. And the cardinality also must depend on degree of the field. This is also very reasonable because if you, if a field get larger, of course, you get more rational points. So these two numbers must appear in any um, reasonable upper bound of this, uh, of this cardinality in some way. Um, then here's a very ambitious bound. That is, the question is, are these two numbers enough? So is this possible to find a number depending only, uh, depending only on the genus and the degree such that the, the, set of uh, the set of rational points on C has cardinality bounded by this capital B? Does such a number exist? Well, this question has an affirmative answer if we assume a widely open conjecture of von Bieri long on rational points on variety of general type. And uh, this was proved by Caborazzo, Harris, and Mazer, and then improved by Bacelli in, the, uh, in 97. So after this proof, there are two divergent opinions. Either one believes this, this bound or one doesn't believe that the very long conjecture is the current statement uh, is, is, is true. Uh, um, instead, here is a, um, a bound, a rather uniform bound, which is proved. Uh, this, this, this bound was conjectured by Mazur. It's called Mazur's, con uh, Mazur's Conjecture B. Um, this is in a joint work with Dimitrov and Habegger. We proved that when G is at least two, we have an upper bound of the, on the cardinality, which is in terms of the genus and the degree of the number field, these two things appears, but it will also depend on the uh, Jacobian, uh, the, the, the rank of the Jacob uh, model, the model we rank of the Jacobian. And we also show that the, this, this, uh, this constant here grows at most polynomially in the degree. Uh, of course, if you only care about uh, 
the case where k equals q, then this the, then this k doesn't uh, then the, this degree doesn't show up here. Um, well, this is Mazur's conjecture B and compare with classical result, the height of C is no longer involved in the bound. Um, and later on, Kuna improved this result. He removed the dependence on the degree in this, uh, in this constant. But still, I want to emphasize here that because we anyways have, in, also in Kuna's result, we anyways have this Baudel V rank, it must be depend on the, the field in a very serious way. So you, you somehow see this see this degree in some way. So um, it's, it's that that's that explains why in in Kuna's result you don't uh, it's seemingly you don't see this degree. Uh, uh, so this result is still reasonable because you have this model will rank. Okay, and. For example, if k equals q, and then you believe uh, the heuristic uh, such, such that the, the model we rank is bounded, then then the, the cardinality is bounded uh, just in terms of g. This is, but if you don't believe the uniform bound, uh, then then the model we rank might be unbounded. <clears throat> okay, so this is the result that we proved as a rather uniform one. And before our proof, uh, there were already results in this direction by different time method and based on Voita's proof by David Philemon and David Nakamai and Philemon in some cases. And Levin Alpagay, he proved that when k equals q and g equals two, the average number of the, of the cardinality of rational numbers on, uh, on C is a finite number, is a finite number, he proved this. And um, by the Chabot T. Coleman method, which is another powerful method to determine the set of rational solutions, um, Michael Stowe proved this result for small rank curves, uh, hyper elliptic curves, and the hyper elliptic condition was remo removed by Katz Rabinov and Schreck Blanc, but still small rank. So each this methods, each each of these these methods are very different. At least currently, they are very different, but they have their own advantages. Like the Dufantan method, we don't depend on the model we rank. We just it works automatically for all curves of any rank. But the Coleman Shabotti method, uh, we we need some uh, condition on the model we rank. Uh, currently, only applies to curves of small rank. But whenever it applies their bound is very sharp. It's so sharp that one can sometimes determine the set of rational solutions, rational points. But also currently, uh, yeah, yeah. So these are the disadvantages of each uh, method. Okay, here's an example. Um, this is a family of genus two hyperelliptic curves. So y squared equals x times x minus one, x minus two, x minus three, x minus four, and x minus s. So we have a parameter, we have a parameter s. It's a one parameter family. In this family of curves, something more particular happens that in, in regards of rational two points on the Jacobian, which I'm not gonna talk about, but what I wanna say is in this example, the model will rank has a better bound in this way so that we can, by our result, the number of rational points on this point, uh, on this curve CS in this one parameter family uh, grows subpolynomially, sub okay? Subpolynomially. Again, in this particular example, I want to emphasize that it's particular in regard of rational two points, uh, rational two torsion on the Jacobian. Okay, so how did we prove this result? Well, actually, we give a further description of um, of the uh, of the um, distribution of this rational points on the curves, which also says something about the small points. And this is the theorem that we prove. I will merge our result with Kuna's result. Uh, we show the following thing. Um, on such a curve like this, around each rational point, the number of, uh, around each algebraic point, uh, the number of other algebraic points, which are not far from this point in this Euclidean space that we defined before, it is uniformly bounded in terms of the genus. And again, what do we mean by not far? Well, not far means that the distance 
is smaller or equal to C1 times, uh, so to some, some constant times of the fault inside. Well, actually square root if we talk about the distance. Well, first of all, this is like a more quantitative version of the Bogomolov conjecture proved by Yumo and Shou Wuzhang. They showed that, they showed this result, uh, but with C1 and C2 unexplicit, uh, it, they, they, are, they are not explicit at all. It, it's just two, two numbers depending only on the C. Uh, in in an unknown way, our result is more explicit for these for 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 the constants, um, and this is another phenomenon of sparsity because it really says that the algebraic points they they are far from each other in a very quantitative way in a very in a quantitative way. Um, let's see how it implies that bound that rather uniform bound. Well, again, this is the picture here. We already show, by the classical result, we don't need to work with the large point now uh, in contrast to model conjecture. Now, let's look at the points inside this ball of, of radius capital R. And now we want to cover this large ball by, by, ball, by some small balls of radius small r, okay? And this small r is, uh, the square root of C1 times the faulting height. So this is capital R, this is small r. And we want to cover the large ball by the small balls. And so first of all, how many small balls do we need to cover the large ball? Well, this is the number. This is, yeah, this is by some simple uh, packing argument. We know that the, the number of small balls we need to cover this large ball is this number, the ratio of the radius. So because if you see the, the, the ratio of the radius to the power of the dimension, and in each small ball, the number of algebraic or rational points is uniformly bounded by C2. So combining these two results, the number of small rational points is at most C2 times capital R over small r rank of JK. And capital R of small r from here, we see it's C naught over C1 rank of JK because the faulting height here cancels out in this ratio. And all these numbers depends only on G. So we have this result. And this is what we desire. desire. We're done for the random uniform bound as soon as we have this new gap principle. Yeah. And actually we proved this result with Dimitrov von Habegger, we proved this result for curves of large heights and Kuna proved this result for curves of small heights. Yeah. Um, so now for Gina, so now we do have uh, some kind of bound, uh, more uniform bound on the cardinality of CK, uh, the fault inside doesn't show up in this bound. Um, so here, the, 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 the final uniformity um, is true subject to the model V rank, subject to the model V rank. And here on the sparsity part, we do have another description of uh, the sparsity of algebraic points by this new gap principle. And next step is effective model. Um, okay, so, so here's the summary. So, Manfold and Voigtas inequality describe how la the large algebraic points are sparse. And we give another description of how all algebraic points are sparse in C. In terms of distance, we don't talk about angles. We don't, we don't have, uh, yeah, we don't talk about angles in this new gap principle. Um, the next step is of course, uh, effective model. It is a conjectural statement which describes where to find the rational points. And at least temporarily, the slogan here is there are no large rational points. If we take this capital R, good enough. The slogan is no large rational points. And what does it mean? Um, I will show it in two minutes, uh, but here is uh, some questions related to our results, um, which, I don't think I have time to talk about, so I'll skip it. Um, so here is the, the conjecture of the effective model. It says that there exists an effectively computable 
um, constant depending only on G, the degree of the number field and the discriminant such that there are no large rational points if we take this C in the capital in the definition of capital R. And little is known about the effective model. Uh, there are some cases known following the manning Demianco method by uh, Gagoli, uh, Veneziano, and Viada. Uh, again, there are some rank conditions. And another approach is the Coleman, uh, uh, Chaboti Coleman Kim method by obtaining sharp bounds. And currently, it is known in the case of k equals q and the rank at most g. Uh, the traditional one by Coleman Shaboti for rank of g, uh, uh, smaller than g, and recently the quadratic Shaboti for some curves of rank g in various publications of Jennifer Balakrishna in collaboration with uh, Besser, Müller, Dogra, uh, etc. Okay, so this is for uh, rational points on curves of at least two. Another aspect is about algebraic torsion points. Um, so we know that on a, uh, on, a, uh, on a curve any, of any genus, the number of algebraic points must be infinite uh, for many, many reasons, um, because otherwise uh, it won't be a curve. Um, we still want to have some finiteness and there's one, and there's a natural way to divide these algebraic points on a curve into equivalent classes. They appear in the natural way in algebraic geometry and in number theory. Um, they are called the torsion packets. And here, this is the definition, the algebraic geometry definition of torsion packets. And me as a number theorist, I take another definition that is consider a point P inside this curve, uh, the algebraic point on this curve, and uh, the torsion packet containing this P is the set of uh, the set of algebraic torsion points on the Jacobian intersect with the, the image of this curve based uh, uh, under the Arbel Jacobi embedding based at P. Oh, so this is the set of torsion packet uh, on C uh, containing this P. The theorem of man, the theorem of Renault, uh, of Renault, known as many manifold conjecture, show uh, is that when G is at least two, then each torsion packet is a finite set. He showed the finiteness. In some kind of uniformity was proved by, by uh, Baker and Poonen. It says that most torsion packets has cardinality, uh, ha have cardinality, and most two. So the, in this torsion packet, you have P and then at most one more point. And this kind of sort of uniformity is that the number of torsion packet of, of points uh, with torsion packets greater than two is bounded above by a number depending on the curve. Again, this number depends on the curve in some unknown way, okay. And also all these theorems, they can, uh, well, the, the many method conjecture is also made in made into uniform, eventual uniform by Lars Kuna. It showed that the torsion packets, the cardinality, it's bounded above in a, by a constant depending only on the genus. And prior to Kuna's proof, uh, the Marco Krieg and Ye proved this result for genus two bioleptic curves using arithmetic dynamics. And Kuna's proof uses distribution theorem in, in addition to techniques and results from Dipin, Schopenhauer, and Habegger. Um, uh, and, and a second proof was proved by Yuan using adelic line bundles. And a third proof is just posted on archive last month by uh, Habegger and myself, uh, which does not use equidistribution. We use Pilazanier method. And um, so, then uh, I will finish my talk with the, the, uh, the, the last slide here. Um, of course, now we have this uniformity. A natural question to ask is that, can we compute this constant? Do we have explicit formula for this? Well, our function field, yes. By Looper, Silverman, and Wilms, they proved that the C prime G can be taken to be quadratic, very explicit over function fields of any characteristic for any non isotrivial uh, curve. So this is a very, very nice bound, it's quadratic. 
Uh, the proofs of Puna and Yuan, unfortunately, they are currently not effective because this equal distribution result is not effective. Uh, our new proof uh, is in principle effective subject to Benjamin's effective pillar Wilkie counting result. However, one can prove a bound, uh, maybe one can prove a bound by our new proof, but the, the, the bound is too large to be practical. Um, so to get uh, an exhibit bound like uh, Looper, Silverman, Wilbs, really one needs more things and other, other ideas. But here is another question, which may be more interesting. So can we make Baker and Poonis result more uniform? That is, in their bound, they said they, they proved that the number of points P with large torsion packet, um, the cardinality is bounded above in a number depending only on C, but the but on C in an unexplicit way. But here we can ask whether we can make this bound depend only on the genus. And here we change this two to six. Uh, the number six is suggested by, by our proof. Uh, actually, Michal Sto uh, also in, in some paper, uh, one can also read off this six uh, by in some previous paper of Michal Sto. And in the end, I want to mention there are also some exciting results uh, for estimatic dynamics by DeMarco, Maraki, uh, Maraki, Schmidt, and Gautier, Vini, and etc. Uh, I think my time is up, so I'll stop here. Thank you.